Hero Nation. Today, I'm going to be covering a vexing pain condition that no doubt you have encountered before while working in neural rehabilitation. It's called central pain syndrome. This is something that every neurotherapist needs to know how to identify and treat. I'm Emily Morgan, occupational therapist and co-founder of NeuroBlog, your video resource for getting fast, focused, and fundamental content on neural rehab topics. You are watching Central Pain Syndrome Part 1, Identify. In this NeuroBlog episode, you will learn six clues that your patient may have Central Pain Syndrome. Be sure to also watch Central Pain Syndrome Part 2, Treatments, coming to you soon. Let's get into it. I think it's first important to note that the central nervous system plays a crucial role for processing pain in the body. However, pain is not always a reliable indicator of the dysfunction. Think about the last time that you got a tiny sliver in your foot. Remember your foot screaming at you and you could not focus on anything else but that itty bitty speck of wood. Now, here's an example of the opposite. What if there was a large tumor that could kill you growing in your body that you didn't even know was there because there wasn't any pain? So see, the size and location of the pain does not tell the complete story of damage. And our brains may or may not interpret the threat correctly. So isn't it fair to say that in some cases, pain's kind of a liar, right? So with central pain syndrome, the problem is stated right in the name. It's coming from the brain. In certain individuals with a central nervous system condition, like a stroke, MS, tumors, spinal cord trauma, or a TBI, the amplification networks in the brain are turned up way too high. Think of it like a receiver on an audio system that's just very sensitive to picking up sound. Another second piece to the puzzle is the brain's neurotransmitters and other network systems that are usually used to doing the job of quieting down a relevant stimuli are not regulated properly. Remember that central pain syndrome is not a disease. It's not caused by peripheral tissue injury. It is a pain syndrome because of a broken brain, brainstem, or spinal cord. And as therapists, we need to be able to look for it, notify the physician, and of course, deal with it properly, not just sweep it under the rug or throw up our hands. So how do you know you are dealing with central pain syndrome? Here are six things to look for. One, the diagnosis or etiology originates from the central nervous system. Remember what I said, if you already know something is broken in the CNS, that's the tip off. Two, there are other sensitivities to external sensory experiences. The patient might tell you uh, that they have an exaggerated response to noises or smells or brightness of lights. You've got to look for these patterns. Three, more often than not, there is a strong emotional response to the stimulus. Many of my patients, they do tear up in therapy, even from just a seemingly small threat like placing my hand on their arm. Even just these perceived threats can provoke strong emotions. The limbic system often gets shaked and rattled over and over again in central pain syndrome, very similar to those who have chronic pain. And because of this, the individual usually presents it with 
fear avoidance behaviors. They start giving up and avoiding activities that they fear will give them pain. And sadly, they end up displaying mental health problems like major depressive disorder and anxiety, which can cause a person to get deeper into the weeds with inactivity and debility. Four, there are certain descriptors of pain and locations to look out for. It is often described as a steady burning or pins and needles. Numbness may or may not be present. It's also quite common to have these sharp lancing bursts of pain that just seem to kind of come out of nowhere. One of my patients referred to them as zingers. The location of pain is often in distal parts of the body, such as hands and feet, but there are certainly individuals who experience it diffusely everywhere. It depends on the nature of their CNS lesions. And in their self-reported outcome measures, they might even see the entire body diagram and circle it all. Um, or perhaps they'll just do the affected hemicide. Five, the pain is not just any pain that comes and goes, but it's unrelenting pain. It's often moderate to severe and lasts longer after the threat has been removed. And here's the key, the pain is disproportionate to whatever you ask them to try to do or how strongly you might have touched them. Light touch often aggravates them as well as temperature change. And six, you've ruled out other reasons that could have contributed to their pain. It's one thing if you have a patient with hemiparesis complaining of shoulder pain, and you notice through special tests there could be an undiagnosed labral or partial rotator cuff tear. But if you are struggling to figure out where this pain is all coming from, and you've really done a thorough physical examination. You should have the differentials of central pain syndrome on your mind. Well, there you have it. These were the six clues that your patient might be experiencing central pain syndrome. It is very important to communicate with the referring physician that they may be experiencing this condition. And this is for three reasons, really. The first is the patient may be taken more seriously. This also puts them in a more favoring light as not being viewed as just a pain medication seeker. Two, the patient will be able to get medical intervention help they need faster. They may need to be referred to a pain management specialist or the physician may choose to start them on specific drugs that target pain coming from the central nervous system. As their treating therapist, you will be happy because if the medication helps with their pain, then they'll be able to make uh, progress faster in therapy. And three, if the physician assesses the patient and agrees with your findings that they have central pain syndrome, it can go in their medical record. It is classified under ICD-10 code as G89.0. And this is a billable diagnosis code. This is obviously important for them to get the treatments they need. Be sure to tune in to Central Pain Syndrome Part 2 treatments coming up. Thanks for tuning into NeuroVlog today and learning more about Central Pain Syndrome. Hope you learned some stuff. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a like down below, click on the bell, and turn on notifications so you'll never miss a NeuroVlog video. See you next time.